Welcome, everybody. This is the U.S. Grace Force Podcast. I'm Doug Barry, along with my very good friend, always most excellent, Father Richard Heilman. And tonight we got with us Patrick O'Hearn is joining us once again. Fantastic author, husband, father, and all around great guy. So we're going to be talking about this great awakening. And I really think we are entering into a great awakening. And so we're going to break that down a little bit and see just what might be going on. Of course, everything needs to start with prayer. And Father yeah. Heilman, we always leave that to you. All right. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Father. And we want to thank all of you out there who support the U.S. Grace Force podcast. We cannot thank you enough for your prayers, your encouragement, the financial support that many of you give us through the Patreon program. If anybody's interested in helping us with that, please click the link in the description below. I would say a few dollars from a number of people can go a long way and help us continue to get these messages out. But also, please don't forget to keep us in your rosaries and in your moments of adoration and a mass intention now and then is great too. We need those prayers very much as well. And we're very thankful for all of you who've given any amount of time to help support, encourage, or pray for everything that we're trying to do here at the U.S. Grace Force. Now, also, you can go out to our official U.S. Grace Force gear page. We've got great stuff out there, t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, and that is another great way to help support the work that we do here at the U.S. Grace Force. And it allows you to get a great message out through some really fantastic apparel. So please check that out. The link is in the description below. You know, one of the things that we try to do with U.S. Grace Force is bring a good, balanced, measured message. We want to really encourage people to wake up and see what's going on around us. We're trying to constantly wake up ourselves to the signs of the times and the church-approved, you know, prophetic messages, scriptural messages, all the different pieces and the different ways that God is trying to speak to our world. And there are things out there that can be a little earth-shaking, a little, a little you know, difficult at times, cause us to struggle. But there are great moments of hope. And tonight is an opportunity we really wanted to dig into this great awakening idea because we're recording this the day after Divine Mercy. It is the Feast of the Annunciation, which has been moved from March 25th to April 8th. It is the day that the, the super rare eclipse just took place here in the United States. And that's all pretty fantastic. And again, there are many prophecies out there and many questions about what could be happening and what's going on and we have posed some of those questions, but we also want people to understand that the, the degree of hope that is in the world right now, especially with things such as what Cardinal Raymond Burke has put out there with that novena that he's asked everybody to pray to Our Lady of Guadalupe, and many other good things that are going on with, with great apostolates and ministries across the board, and we're seeing tremendous responses and results. And so we want to talk about some of what we've seen even this last weekend. So our guest tonight, Patrick O'Hearn. Patrick, you've been with us before, and it is great to have you back, my friend. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's it's, it's an honor to be here again. Well, I know you, last time you were on, we were talking about that great children's book, and we encourage it. I'm going to put a picture up, up here on the screen right now for people to go check it out. The link is in the description. This is a fantastic book on Our Lady of Sorrows that you wrote for children. Really amazing. And thank you. You sent me a copy. Incredibly well done. So encourage the audience, go out there and check this book out. Um, you've got other work that you're involved in we're going to get yeah, into. Let me just yeah. uh, give a little pitch for that book as well, because I know our good friend, uh, Father Chad Ripiger, he's a very mm. famous and well-respected exorcist. Um, he believes that in these times that Our Lady of Sorrows is incredibly powerful. And for you to uh, make this, Patrick, for for children, to try to get them formed and to understand and help them uh, enter into that beautiful devotion. And, and I think especially for these times, it is a, a very, very yeah. powerful devotion. But uh, it's it's one of the one of the great tools of our times. But uh, there's so many others that we're going to talk about tonight. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you were saying, Doug? Yeah, that's right, Father. And for anybody out there who's got questions about whether or not this is a great book, then just remember Father Chad Ripperger is supporting it. And, and Patrick, didn't he write, he wrote uh, the foreword for this book, did he not? He did. He wrote the foreword, and then he also wrote four original prayers for children, you know, a prayer for their vocation, a 
prayer for protection from Mary, uh, you know, a prayer for a daily a prayer of gratitude, and then like a nightly blessing, basically the exorcist prayers for, you know, spiritual warfare prayers for children. Wow. Wow. That's Everybody fantastic. get this book for your kids. It's yeah. awesome. Anybody out there who does not have this, please go out again, click the link in the description, go check it out. Now we've got a, another If book you're I not, know we're going if, to get into. Yes, yeah, Father, go but ahead. well, I just want to say if, you know, if some people might be just getting an introduction to Our Lady of Sorrows, Mm. well, that sounds sad, but it's, it's a tender heart is what it is. The tender heart of a mother is what it really boils down to. She was, she was sad that, you know, uh, facing these, these, these different things. So anyways, it's, it's a really beautiful book. So ever get it. Yeah, and that's a great point. I mean, just let's just address this maybe briefly. You just maybe think of something there, Father. Is we know all these different titles of Our Lady, and maybe Patrick, you can address this about why Our Lady of Sorrows in particular, because we have, um, you know, Virgin Most Powerful and Our Lady of, of of Perpetual Help and so forth and so forth. The Litany of Our Lady. There are many, many different titles, but this particular one, Our Lady of Sorrows, has a unique has a unique something to it. That's a mystery. but incredibly powerful. Uh, can you speak as to why this particular title or any history to why this particular title can, can really impact us in, in such a way? I really think of all the titles of Mary, Our Lady of Sorrows is the most that we can most relatable title to her because she understands our suffering more than you know more than any other title. You know, you have Our Lady of Victory, you have Our Lady of Champion, Our Lady of Fatima. But under the title of Our Lady of Sorrows, in in these times when, you know, as we experience great suffering and persecution, it's it's that title of Mary that she can. You know, she we console her heart, but she consoles ours. So I think that that that's why it makes it. even more impactful. And then just these, you know, as we talked about on the, the this previous show, you know, one of the promises attached with these, with this devotion and, and the one about protecting you against the infernal enemy at every moment, you know, I don't know any other promises like that where she's guarantees that she'll protect us at every moment. And then also at the moment of our death, you know, we will see her face. So again, it's a protection against the devil. And it's also just preparing us not only in our sufferings, but preparing us as we cross this life to eternity. Right, right, right. Yeah, and that was one of the great titles, uh, I think, that you know um, we put out on the podcast last time you were with us. I loved the name of that title. This will protect you from the infernal enemy. We, we didn't come up with those words. That is the fifth promise from Mary herself for people who have a devotion to her under this title, Our Lady of Sorrows. Is that, is that correct, Patrick? That's correct. Yeah. That's powerful. So anybody go back. Uh, I'll put, in fact, right here, I'll put a link, check it out in the box above my head. Click that link there and that'll take you out to the video of the podcast that we did with Patrick on this amazing uh, devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows that uh, she will protect us from the infernal enemy. Uh, we need that. Um, you know, Patrick, again, this weekend, something powerful happened. Divine Mercy Sunday, at the time we record this, it is the 8th. It is the day of the eclipse uh, that just took place today. It is also the Feast of the Annunciation moved from March 25th. Since it fell into Holy Week, the church moves it to the first day after the octave of Easter. And here we are. And Father, you and I were talking earlier about something magnificent that you saw happen this weekend and that you had heard from some other priests. And then Patrick, when I talked to you, you experienced it personally as well. Father, tell us, I mean, I just think it's phenomenal. What, what did you experience this weekend? Well, we went into the weekend, or into... Yeah, the weekend uh, with Divine Mercy and then followed by the Eclipse. And there were so many coincidences, like the Feast of uh, of Our Lady uh, or the Annunciation, uh, which is an amazing feast. It's the first decade of the Rosary. It's the Angelus. Uh, but it's, it's and I like to say it's, it's the real Christmas. If we're pro-life, Jesus comes into the world, uh, into the womb of Mary, and he's alive, okay? And so, um, so that landed on the feast when they moved it off of um, the Holy Week and beyond uh, the octave of, of, of uh, Easter. And so that's amazing. But there were all kinds of other things, and we, we, we've done it in the show in the past. So people, people, I think, were starting to really think, okay, what's going on? And then I said the coincidence that I thought was one of the biggest ones is that The uh, the feast of the um, Divine Mercy landed the week before, um, or the day before this this eclipse, 
Well, again, I didn't know what God was doing or what was going on. I, you can speculate. I didn't want to prophesy or anything like that. Obviously, God does the opposite every time I get prideful and think I can predict things. Um, so I was just watching. And I think a lot of people were. But here's what I did is that, you know, that Divine Mercy Devotion offers an opportunity to not only have your sins forgiven, but the um, the temporal punishment due the sin through through that uh, practicing that devotion on that day. And I says, you know, I, I want to do this. And, and I, 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 I talked about this before, but uh, one of the sins that uh, I have let become a repetitive sin for me is forgetting to do my bravery when I'm supposed to. I'll wake up one morning, oh, I didn't do it bravery last night, you know. Well, that's just undisciplined. It's lazy, and I'm I'm always confessing that it's a repetitive sin in my life. Mm. And uh, and you know you know what I said? No more. I truly repent of this. And and to me, that again, what repentance truly means is that you're not only asking forgiveness for the sin, but you're resolved to be done with that sin. You're resolved. I think a lot of times we go to confession, we'll go, oh, okay, I'm just, I'm just going to do it again, but I'll confess it. But, uh, you know, it's, and then the sin has us, it, it, it owns us. So uh, and I wrote, I wrote a short article about this today because I was just expressing my thoughts like this, but so we didn't know what's going to go on. And we had our divine mercy, um, devotion. And so we set up in all four churches in Janesville with us four priests here that each one of us would be at a church. And we would offer confession for from 1.30 until 3, and then we would come out, we would pray the chaplet before the Blessed Sacrament, the adoration was going on during confessions, uh, and then we would do benediction, and then we'd be done. Well, no, we weren't. The line wrapped around the church still. The, 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 the confessions, uh, that hour and a half, one after another, there wasn't three seconds. The, in other words tons of people showed up and then i heard that was happening to all the other churches in jamesville then i get on social media and hear that's happening everywhere that 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 a historic level of lines for the confessionals on divine mercy sunday and i'm going praise god and i gotta tell you that a a, a good number of the confessions i heard on divine mercy sunday bless me father for i've said it's been seven years it's been 15 years, it's been 30 years uh, since my last confession. Mm -hmm. A lot of people saying, this is the time. I want, uh, I'm taking this time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and who knows if, you know, the fact that this historic event with the, with the solar eclipse uh, had anything to do with it, I do think it did. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people were just kind of, you know what, I better make sure here because I don't know what God's up to. At least that's where I was. And I do believe a lot of souls were. And so, and Father, me, I'm for, sorry, Father. And you said you heard this from other priests as well. This wasn't just your your own personal experience. No, like I other said, it happened were in all the, the other churches in Janesville. And then I got yeah. on social media and heard that it's happening everywhere across the United States. Nice, nice. That long, long lines for the confessional, his, I, I say, historic levels mm -hmm. of lines for the confessional and people wanting to be granted that's the special call it indulgence, but that you receive on, on divine mercy Sunday, it, not only forgiveness of sins, but the temporal punishment due to your sin. Mm. You know, and I always say, what does that mean? Well, I always use you know, a parent with a child, they do something, you know, they're not supposed to. And, and you call them out on it. And the child says, I'm sorry. And the parent goes, okay, okay. I get that. You're sorry. All right, good. All right, come here. Give me a hug, and you're grounded for a week. Hmm. <laughs> you know, but, but why? Because the parent is forming that child and trying to drum into that child that this is serious. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think, and I hope we get into parenting on this show too, because you wrote a great book about that, the parents about the saints, Patrick. But I think a lot of that's missing, where parents are like instead. You know, you do something bad and you, you say you're sorry and, okay, here's a box of Butterfinger uh, candy for you, you know, instead of helping them. But see, that's what I'm saying. God is the perfect father. There is temporal punishment. However, 
there is a way out of that. And isn't it the soul that says, not only am I sorry, but I will never do this again. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you got the parents' attention. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the way it works in the divine life, in our relationship with God, our perfect Father in heaven. And, and that's what really what we're doing here with this divine mercy devotion, or anytime someone seeks a plenary indulgence, they're, they're saying, because they have to be not only free of the sin, but free from attachment to the sin. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so if we're going to confession, it's just saying, <clears throat> yeah, I'm confessing it, but I'm, I know myself. I'm going to do this again, you know. Then you're attached to the sin, okay? Then God might have some more temporal punishment, you know, the analogy of the grounder for the weak, in order to help you get to a place, all right, that you that you finally go, nope, no, nope, I'm not going to do that anymore. I, I'm going to try my hardest to not do that anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So here we are, and I can't help but believe that and we're seeing other signs of it too. Um, you know, college campuses, there's amazing things happening. We're seeing in other places where uh, there's a kind of a revival happening. And every time I see that, I go, oh, I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. I want a revival. I want, there's I want a movement. A, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and a great awakening. Uh, and I love our title too, because, you know, we, we always hear about woke. Well, that's just people who want to blow their horn and feel superior over others because they, they believe they have secret knowledge that the other, that the common folk don't have. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's not what we're talking about here with a great awakening. A great awakening is pretty much what I just described there that a person gets to a point where they go, you know, and, and I, I pointed to Thomas this weekend in the scriptures. He, he said, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God, you get to that place. And then you're like, I, can't do this anymore. I can't dismiss that, oh, this is a sin. I always did. No, I'm not going to do it. My Lord and my God. Mm -hmm. That person is awakened. All right. That person is awakened. So you know, um, thank you for my my little homily there. But uh Patrick, I mean, were both of you guys uh for the total eclipse where where you were living? Were yeah, well, I, I saw it, yeah. Uh, Patrick, you went to visit family, and so you could see it, right? I did. I visited my parents in in Ohio to see it. Nice. Yeah. But but and I saw it on the news, and it, we had a darkened sky here. I tried looking up, and I didn't have the glasses. But uh, I think it was about I don't know sixty percent covered. But it was eerie uh, outside too. A lot of people are reporting that too. That yeah. that real stillness that comes. Yeah. But anyways. Um, what I don't know what you guys think, and Patrick, I'll point this at you, but you know, I want us to be hopeful. Okay, we talk about chastisements and these prophecies and everything, and maybe maybe that's coming. But how about a great awakening? You know, Patrick, can you can you talk about that? I mean, are you getting any sense that you know there's a possibility of us awaking from our slumber and and uh and 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 having that holy spirit fire and love and awe and wonder of god again i do you know my son and i and we try to go to confession on went this past saturday and the line was so you know backed up that we couldn't even make it in time but it was normally it's a bunch of old people in line but i saw several young people and then That's thankfully wonderful. we were able to go on sunday and uh you know they had two priests during mass and i mean it was all young people in line. So I was, that just gave me so much hope. You know, that they say it's almost the weird, is, isn't yeah. it? It's almost weird. Yeah. They say the church is dying, but it, it, it's not, you know, in these young Well, not at this moment, it's not. Yeah. I mean, there's something going on. Yes. Yeah, so, so just seeing the young people, you know, that are drawn to the reverence, to the tradition, you know, of the Catholic church and, and this need for a confession, you, you know, it's, I, it really struck me during, you know, Good Friday. It's like, well, if I had sinned less, you know, Lord, you would have suffered less. And I think that just taking ownership of our sin and, and that's what, you know, I think as, as parents too, you know, we don't just, you know, if you just say, Hey, go to confession, but when you're leading the way and you're in line with your son and you're, you're breaking in the priest before your son. Right. Uh, but you just, you, as you know, some of these parents, the saints did, they would take their children regularly to confession and they would, they would, put even some of their children on their knees and go through their sins and uh, help them with the examination of conscience. So I do see, yeah, that this great awakening, it's happening, you know, in the church 
and uh, you know, just this, this need of uh, repentance that I think uh, we're seeing whether people are, maybe they're afraid of death, they're afraid of what's around the corner, but I also think that there's just, there's this great hunger to be saints. And so that, I think that's a, a huge impetus for this uh, revival of confession that I'm seeing and uh, rev Eucharistic revival. Yeah, and that's something I, I would I would say too. And Patrick, I know you 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 make a good point about seeing the confession lines being long. I mean, a lot of times we just get kind of used to clocking in, clocking out. That was my experience growing up as a Catholic. You know, and I started going every month due to the advice from a spiritual director years ago, and then another spiritual director several years later said I should go every couple of weeks. Um, clearly, he saw more problems in me than the previous spiritual director did. But I started going to confession every two weeks. Um, uh, many years ago and have stuck with it. And it's been a tremendous, you know, help to me. And I agree with everything Father just said, you know, there has to be that resolve that when I, every time I go, it's like, this is it. I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm changing. I am changing my life. Do not want to fall into this again. I want to improve. And a lot of times it's incremental little steps, you know, little improvements along the way. But I, I think that when you were talking about this earlier, about th this personal experience that you had combined with what Father had said, I just thought that was kind of, you know, maybe a divine inspiration to discuss this. Because you're right, Father, we address a lot of things on prophecies. We saw something last October happen, the attack on the Holy Land. There were messages that that was going to happen. Something, I should say, forgive me, something rather was going to happen in October that would ramp up and intensify trials and tribulations for the world. And that has happened. Now, the eclipse took place today, April 8th. There are people out there who mocked the idea that God would do anything and that anybody who was questioning these things or, you know, the possible uh, results of some sacrifice of a red heifer, these these things are being talked about. Um, you know, the, the uh, Hadron Collider in the CERN over in Switzerland is, was, uh, I guess, fired up today on April 8th, and they're trying to find the God particle. Okay, just some very strange stuff. Okay, let's look at it all. And then there are people who will kind of mock this and say, nothing happened. I guess none of it is true. I would simply say, take a deep breath and wait, because we don't know God's timing on things. Um, we have had reports of of warnings in the past. And Patrick, I'd like you to, if you could talk a little bit about, in particular, you know, we, we you mentioned La Salette earlier, Our Lady of Cabijo in particular, though, she ties very directly to Our Lady of Sorrows. That was warning. That was a call for conversion. And the result of not responding the way she wanted, the way she asked, and again, I remind the audience, we all have to remember, she does not do these things of her own accord. She does these things because her son sends her to say and do these things. And so we have this event that took place in Rwanda in the 80s. The, they saw this image of the genocide that would take place. Uh, in 1982, they saw the image and it took place in 1994. But can you talk a little bit about the warnings of our Blessed Mother there and why these warnings from heaven, and again, you had mentioned La Salette earlier too, why these warnings from heaven call for conversion are so critical and so essential. And then when we see that in relation to confession lines, like we've just talked about, that's what we're aiming for, that the warnings are about moving the heart and the soul of all of us to get in that confession line with the resolve and the attitude that we're going to change our lives. Patrick, Rwanda, Our Lady of Cabijo in Rwanda, talk a bit about that in the call for conversion. So the, the first apparition happened around 1981, and Our Lady gave you know several messages to three visionaries. They were in their, I think, around 18 or 19 years old, and at the the heart of the message was repentance, you know. And she said, "Repent, repent, you know, convert while there's still time." And she showed the visionaries, you know, what would happen if there wasn't repentance. And so they saw rivers of blood, and they saw bodies everywhere, and sadly that came to fruition in the night, you know, and it started in 1990 with, you know, I think there's over a million people were killed, but um, so, so it was this message of repentance and also mortification and fasting. And one of the messages too was involved in just like Fatima, uh, but pray and fasting and to our lady of sorrows was really connected. And that was, she encouraged the visionaries to spread devotion to our lady of sorrows, specifically praying the rosary of our lady of sorrows on Tuesdays, and uh, on Fridays, and then it was to do um, to pray the rosary every single day. So all of this, all of these warnings 
were, you know, at the heart of it was repentance. And uh, sadly, you know, they, and she, another thing she says, you know, she said, if, if you do not repent, you know, you will fall into the abyss. You know, mankind is on this trajectory of, of um, you know, it's, it's heading down the wrong course, but she did, you know, I think anything that our lady says, she gives us hope that, you know, there's a chance, you know, we have a chance to change that. It's not like we're doomed for hell. Like we, we have a chance. And so she gave the visionaries a chance, but, you know, sadly people, you know, they didn't heed those, those messages. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. but I would think, I would think real quick, follow up, quick follow up. I would think that those types of stories, when we talk about them and we have talked about these types of things many times on this podcast, we're trying to spread what heaven through Our Lady is saying to the world about how serious it is, how urgent, not with anxiety, but urgency is different than anxiety, I always say. Urgency says there's something serious upon us, now act in the appropriate manner to get the job done. A anxiety can cause paralysis almost. You can feel like you just can't function. You're so anxious over things. That's not what she's talking about. But she is saying that it's urgent. Is that not correct, Patrick? It is. It's, it's an urgent call. And like we've seen in every prophecy, you know, in every message from Our Lady, even going back to, you know, Champion, Wisconsin in 1849, when she's saying, you know, pray for the conversion of sinners, offer your communion. And so we have an opportunity, you know, every mass we go to, every rosary, you know, every time we go and say a prayer before the Blessed Sacrament, or, you know, especially the, I think the prayer of the rosary, you know, oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Mm -hmm. So that's such a powerful prayer that we can say every day and uh for the, for the conversion of sinners mm -hmm. i was going to say too that i'm listening to you and and the messages repent 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 that was just my little homily talked about that's that's the essence of it, it, it and we're seeing that and it's so, so there's so much hope that people are truly repenting because again uh, uh, Doug, you'll use the, uh, the the way of describing it, punch the clock Catholics or, hmm. you know, uh, just treating it uh, almost like a superstition too. You know, yeah. I, I better go or something bad might happen. But no, he, the, God wants our heart hmm. and he wants, he, he wants us to live. And here's, here's the word I've been um, pointing to the most, because you could look at a lot of like the fruit of the Holy Spirit and things like that. Uh, but I, I'm I'm pointing to the word peace. God wants us to live in peace, and so when you hear like repent or the, or the great abyss, I I think of that that's utter chaos and it's turmoil and it's you know it's the opposite of peace is what that is, and I believe that's really what hell is all about. You know, you're just in this internal chaos and 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 uh, turmoil, and you know, uh, for eternity, uh, and heaven is just this this place of peace, but, but God wants us to live today in peace and he wants us to help others to live today in peace. And that's what I was thinking too, is that that's actually the motto of the grace force. We, we embraced, and I love it. It's per virtutum pax. That's the Latin for peace through strength. And more and more people, we're talking about great awakening, more and more people I think are awakening to that understanding. How do we get peace? Well, we're not going to do it by going and confessing our sins and saying to ourselves, well, I'll probably confess it next week, or I'll probably do it next week. No, I'll probably keep doing it. And, and you just kind of treat your, you, you lazily and 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 uh, uh, carelessly uh, approach your religion, if you do it at all. Uh, and even, even the way that we offer the Mass in the vast majority of places is, is, uh, is so casual and careless um uh, you know they they might have a quality choir that gives us a good some good show tunes while we're doing that you know i, I i'm sorry i feel cynical because I'm, I'm so i'm so tired of of us remaining in the place of weakness so that we are now vulnerable to the attacks of the devil here's the um uh here's a challenge coin that we have for the uh, grace force. But anyways, it says Paravo Tutum Pax on it. But the point I'm trying to make is here's a time that we have. We got a time to make a choice. And I think that's what these uh, prophecies, that's what these apparitions of the Blessed Mother, these messages that have been received are all saying. Listen, you can live in peace. 
-hmm. if you take your faith seriously, if you truly love God, if you truly want to be in relationship with God, uh, uh, one of the lines from um, one of the readings for Divine Mercy Sunday, I believe, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was, but um, they they followed the commandments and the commandments were not burdensome. Mm. When you're strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, you 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 just go, well, that repentative sin that laid hold of me and owned me, uh, of course I can't do that anymore. It's not a burden. Because you know why? You're an amazing God. And I love you so much, God. You gotta we gotta get to that point. We gotta get to that awakening, okay, from our slumber to that point. And and so I'm driven, and I know you guys are too, to do everything that we can for, to first of all help people heed the messages. First of all, hear the messages. That's why we talk about these uh messages that are being received in our time. Um and and to but but to truly let it get in. And I don't know why an eclipse did it for me this weekend, because I've had I've had other moments, but I don't know, it felt it, it particularly strong this weekend that Divine Mercy Sunday before this historic event with the with the eclipse, and then 40 days more is Pentecost, and then the Feast of the Annunciation lands on it, then the eclipse is traveling through the cities of Nineveh. I mean, I'm just going, um, I'm going to get right with God, okay? I'm going to totally repent. And I think thousands, if not millions of people had that feeling, praise God, this weekend. Thus, the long lines for confession. It's time to come home. Thus, the many confessions I heard on Divine Mercy Sunday said, Bless me, Father, I said it's been 30 years since my last confession. You know, I got another appointment tomorrow that somebody's coming after 30 years. Um, you know, so it's it's it, it's it's heartening. It's hopeful that that there seems to be a great awakening going on in our times. Hmm. And so um, you mentioned, Patrick, uh, these messages. Um, what was it that Our Lady of Champion, because did, shouldn't she advocate too for repentance? Because I, I, I have a particular fondness because that, cause that's in my state. Um, it's up near Green Bay, Wisconsin. And I think it's a cool thing that she's called Our Lady of Champion next to Green Bay Packers. But anyways... But <laughs> but anyways, I'm fond of I'm fond of Our Lady of Champion. What did she say? And one thing, they're, I mean, they're opening the cause. Hopefully, in the next pretty soon for the, the cause of canonization for yes. Sister Adele. And I mean, one of the things that you know, she said, make a general confession. Our Lady, you know, asked her, and I think that's a beautiful for all of us. You know, at some point in our life, you know, we should make a general confession. Yep. And then you know, she said, you know, receive communion and offer that for the conversion of sinners. You know, and and if you know. If, and if mankind doesn't repent, you know, there was, you know, the element of punishment, but the, the hopeful message at the end, you know, that our lady says to sister Adele says, go and fear nothing. I will help you. And I think those words that we need to hear that, like, you know, we're, with all these things that are going around us, go and fear nothing. I will help you. And uh, father, I did, I did want to mention, I heard a great homily uh, from census fidelium from a priest, but I heard with, that. one. Yeah. With, with the eclipse, you know, yep. it was just in real quick, but just with first Friday. His brother ended yeah. up texting me too and telling, "Hey, that's my brother." <laughs> first Friday, you have first, you know, you have first Saturday, Divine Mercy Annunciation. So all of these, these are powerhouse devotions, and all of those, the Sacred Heart, you know, Our Lady of Sorrows, and you know, they all promise peace. And I think that we know, you know, with with the messages too, with Our Lady of Champion, you know, when we get right with God, when we go to confession, it's it's the it's the most peace you'll ever experience, you know, after going to confession. And uh, so I think this is what Our Lady is saying: Get right with my Son, and I will give you that divine peace, and I will give you that protection that you need to face any battle that's coming. Yeah, it was Father Zanetti. I look back mm -hmm. on my text. Father Zanetti gave that amazing homily. Maybe we could put a link to that in the uh, description. Sure, that'd be yeah, great. Be it's really you gotta you gotta hear it. It's amazing. Yeah, and, and you know, um, Patrick, I got a couple questions. When I ask you before I say it, I, I just want again, I want to encourage the audience to remember that this eclipse may have taken place, um, but I, I just I just think that we're wise considering all the signs of the times that we're seeing right in our face. I mean, the threat of an escalation of war reaching a level of an entire World War III. And some believe that we're already kind of in the beginning stages of that. Um, you know, all the different things that we're seeing with the breakdown of morality, decency, 
um, crime in cities and so forth. Okay. And again, not doom and gloom talk here, but there are factual statistics out there. There are things that are showing themselves that are very disturbing and very godless. And we do have to be aware of the signs of the times. In addition, these prophetic messages, some still need to be very seriously discerned and vetted. Of course, I would say keep them at arm's length, which is, you know, I don't embrace them like I do Akita or or Our Lady of Fatima or Lourdes or some of those that we know the church has thoroughly vetted, investigated, Our Lady of Cabijo in Rwanda and such. But with all of that said, Patrick, what is more powerful? What is more important? A good confession or an exorcism? We get caught up in the drama of some of these amazing in events going on. And really, isn't it that the most simple thing we can do, pray that rosary, go to Mass faithfully, and go to confession? What is more important? I mean, what is more powerful? I'll say more important, because exorcisms are great. They're necessary. The Church gives us that ministry. But isn't a confession more powerful overall than an exorcism? It is. That's what you know, Father Ripperger and all the exorcists say. You know, the most powerful thing you can do is, you know, to, to go to confession and, you know, to get your sins absolved. And as Father mentioned, too, it's just this idea of, I don't want to sin anymore. And I think you go to that mindset. When you go to confession, you know, it's, again, it's, it's approaching it. Like a lot of these people that came this past weekend, I mean, they thought maybe there's a chance that the world could come to an end. Who knows? But it's like, we never know when God's going to call us home. And I think that's where the saints said, like when they went to confession, they, they approached it as if it was their last confession. They took it seriously because they, you know, you could die on your way home in a car crash or the world could come to an end. But it is that that level of just being ready, being ready to stand before God. And, uh, you know, and when, when we sin less too, like we're, we're, we're helping the body of Christ, as I mentioned before, and when you guys had me on, like our sins, they 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 cry out for for justice, and so we want to be right with God and and to experience that divine peace that only He can bring through the sacraments. And I know what Father what Father was saying earlier about the importance of the heart. Um, just real quick follow up is the the importance of helping to prepare somebody for a good confession the importance of taking the steps when i say helping somebody i'm talking specifically parents you know my kids have all moved out i have grandkids now your kids are still young living at home you took your son to confession for anybody out there watching listening right now it's easy to get caught up in the drama of the prophecies and the messages and i understand that and there's something about that that is very engaging and, you know, you can see that when you look at a video out there of someone talking about a prophecy of a coming chastisement, and the numbers are big because people are, they're, they're drawn by that. But we should be very serious about looking at the information that teaches and trains how to examine the conscience, how to prepare for a good confession for ourselves, and how to prepare those that God has entrusted to our care for a good confession. And, and I know you've written a book on even parents of saints who have helped in that case. Um, can you address um, just a little bit about the importance of preparing for a good confession, training and preparing those that God has entrusted to our care for a good confession, and and then this book that you've got, and we want to get we'll get a picture about on the screen here and all because this is something that is absolutely essential, not as dramatic, not as sensational as prophecies of World War III and such. Those are those are important enough to pay attention to, but this is the day to day thing. You know, Father's in that confessional every week. I mean, they're, the priests like Father, they're out there every every week, sometimes every day, waiting for souls to come in. Patrick, the preparation, the formation, can you can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, in my book, I talk a little bit about certain saints, like St. Gemma, like her mother would have scheduled confession every Saturday. And when she became ill, she even had her neighbor take her kids. That's how serious it was. And she would mm -hmm. take her daughter on her knee and... And St. Gemma was just a, a childlike soul. And and she would, as she was preparing, it would it would move even her own mother to tears, just that simplicity of, of heart. And then we have also St. Zelie Martin, you know, the mother of St. Therese. She would put, you know, her daughters on her lap and just go, you know, walk through an examination of conscience with them. And so those, those were a couple stories. And, you know, in Zelie, she had her own spiritual director. And again, they frequented the sacraments, you know, at least once a month. And so I think these saints, you know, they were able to, you know, by by their own children, seeing them on their knees and just, you know, just going through, going through confession, it, it inspired them. So those were a few things, just that example of, you know, seeing a father and a mother on their knees and taking the taking confession seriously and inspired their own children. And in, in terms of, you know, obviously examination of conscience, I know 
you know, they didn't have Father Rippinger's examination of conscience, but he has an amazing one in his book, Deliverance Prayers for Laity. Now, that may be too exhaustive for children, but I think, again, just that act of, you know, just, just, you know, bringing your children on your knees and just talking about, you know, having them acknowledge their sins. I think those are some of the things that, um, you know, to not be afraid of confession. You know, th those are those are ways that I saw that the parents of the saints, you know, they helped uh, steer their children to make the best confession. And then it was something that wasn't an afterthought. You know, this was something that they scheduled, you know, as I said, St. Gemma's mother, it was, it was every Saturday they went. So it was a priority, in other words. Correct. And, and uh, uh, you know, Sister Lucia, you know, her mother uh, prepared her daughter, you know, when, when that whole warning was going to come with the son, if it didn't happen, you know, Sister Lucia's mother, Maria Rosa, was afraid that her daughter was going to get killed. And mm. so she said to her, if you're going to die, I'm going to die with you. And mm. so they both went to confession before that. And, and what an example, you know, just to, you know, just, just to always be ready. And so I think that's what these parents of the saints did. They, they, it was a priority. It was the most important priority confession and, and receiving the Eucharist were the two, the pillars of the parents of the saints. What, awesome. uh, what was the um, message? Was it Fatima that uh, the attack will first come against marriage in the family? Is that, is that Fatima? That's Fatima. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. She uh, said, yeah. That's where she said that she told us she that the final battle would be between uh, would be over marriage and family. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I agree with that. I mean, let's stop and take a good look around right now. <laughs> hmm. How many, how many sacramental marriages are there anymore? Hmm. Look at the divorce rate. Uh, look what's happening with, with families. Uh, uh, they're having one, two ch children, maybe abort and the rest. I don't know. Um, but, and, and uh, the focus is not on the children. I mean, I, I, honestly, there's great parents out there, obviously. But by and large, the attack on marriage, traditional marriage, and the family, the upbringing of solid and strong spiritually formed children is really the the uh, the essence of what we're dealing with right now. And, and uh, uh, you know, if we're going to start heeding messages, I mean, let's start with Fatima. And understand that we need to make serious moves to recover a traditional marriage and to recover that strong parenting. I love that you wrote this book, The Parents of the Saints. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's so needed. You know, how can we be parents of saints? But it just seems like, um, and and here's what's happening too. We're being lied to, but they're trying to establish new normals. Slowly but surely, and then all of a sudden, boom, it's a new normal. And the new normal is, let's not even get married. Uh, you know, if we have children, let's, you know, let's hardly see them as we send them over to uh, J daycare. And you know what I mean? And uh, those are becoming established normals of, of our time. And raising a child, you know, I'd like to, to learn to go to confession. How about take them to the mass at all? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, on on, on uh, days of obligation, on Sundays and holy days, um, I mean, forming the children so that what? And here we are, peace through strength. You should want your child to have more than anything else, peace. I mean, that's where mental stability comes from, psychological well-being, certainly spiritually uh, well formed. But uh, when that when that soul is at peace, right? Yeah, they're going to hit challenges and conflicts, but they're going to do it with a peace in their heart and a, a, sure, a blessed assurance that God's got them. And, and we can do this together. All of that, I, I just feel, can I get your comment on that? I mean, I, I, the essence of the problem, I believe, is what was um, what the message of Fatima said, it'll start with marriage and family. What, can you comment on that? Do I think parents at these times need to be bold. And, you know, I have even back in the day in St. Teresa's time, there was a neighbor that was trying to dress them up as boys. And she immediately took her children's like, I will have none of that. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, she saw the errors already at the time. And, and another example that I love, you know, St. Louis Martin, and I consider Louis and Zelly Martin, they are the most relatable saints. I mean, cause I just, they, they under, they, 
in terms of, um, you know, they, they can just relate to common, you know, to the common man, just what they went through, all their different sufferings. But another example is, you know, St. Louis's daughters, when they would walk in the summertime, you know, there's people that are changing in modest dressing. And he always told his daughters, you know, custody the eyes. So they were, they, they, they were, and they even monitored what kind of books they were reading. I mean, they, you might call them helicopter parents, but they were so concerned that their children wouldn't sin. And, uh, and I think they're just an example, you know, that th this battle that we have so many parents are just succumbing to the, you know, to the, to the world. And, and as I, I think it was one of the popes said, the greatest sin of the 20th century. So it was the loss of the sense of sin. And I think that's where these parents, of the saints realize like, no, I'm, I'm not going, I'm not going on, not on my watch. Are you going to go to hell? And so they were just, you know, um, just constantly in touch with their children and also just making sure that, again, the sacraments were everything and keeping them from, from the occasion of sin. And so that's where I see you know, this great battle. And unfortunately, most parents don't even think it's a battle. Um, they just give it into the devil and the world and the flesh. But uh, the parents of the saints. Uh, one of the things you not. said, one of the things you said there, Patrick, was uh, helicopter parents. And it made my brain go right away because that's. A negative label to put on on something that what is that I love my children and I want to be around them I want to make sure they're safe I want to make sure they're they're not being naughty they're, that they're being formed well oh no that's a helicopter parent you know or, or you're a strong father you know and and you're you're yeah. uh, you're doing everything to be a um, a secure and uh, what do you protector and provider of that family oh no you're misogynist. Uh, you're, you're, you're a, uh, what do they call that? Uh, toxic masculinity, mm -hmm. right? See all the, see what we're doing. We're being manipulated. Okay. We're being manipulated. And that's one of the things I take the greatest offense to is strong dads. Now I, again, and right away when you think, when you start talking about strong dads, Oh, that's the one that beats the wife across the house all day long. No, no, no. That's not what we're talking about. Okay. Right. And they're toxic masculinity and all that. Oh my gosh, are we being deceived and lied to? And they're trying to change uh, us away from what is uh, the essence, uh, what, what creates that strength in that family. Yes, the husband is traditionally the provider and the protector. He's a show of strength. And the, the, the mom can be strong too, but hers is in tenderness and care, you know, um, and, and and but no no you're you're enslaving women I, oh my goodness it's it's and and what we need now is more and more voices that are standing up for men who want to be that strong uh masculine father and husband you know uh and 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 not let them own the narrative and create new normals uh, these times that we're living in right now are critical uh, as and here's why because who is standing up against those liars okay and if you dare do it what are you oh no you're an evil person and you're you're uh, you're political or you know whatever uh to to get us to be censored to get us to be um uh cast out you know or canceled uh whatever whatever the punishment they can inflict on anybody that's trying to save marriage and family that's trying to save children that's trying to save our morality trying to save our spirituality um we need more and you know what if you stand up and you're going to get called whatever name they're going to do to try to get you to shut up you got to just be a champion you got to be a hero you got to just take it and keep going right patrick yep right i mean one of the one of the stories i include in the book was you know St. Padre Pio's father, he came to the United States on two occasions, you know, to make more money in order to provide for their family. And, and Padre Pio said, you know, if my father didn't make those sacrifices, I would have never became a priest. And his yeah. father missed his son's own ordination because he was in America making money for the family. But in the same time, his father was monitoring his son's education. And one time Padre Pio was sent to a school that was run by a, a very liberal ex-priest. And he, and he, when he found that out, he 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 wrote and he he told his wife, "You pull him from that school." So I think his parents, 
you know, we have to we have to monitor where, where our kids, you know, especially in the public schools, we see the the run by communism, communists. And it's like right. we gotta monitor, you know, it it's like God's given us this precious treasure and we have 18 years with them. And, you know, we need to be the ones that form them, not the not the CCD class on Sunday or you know, the public schools or the daycare. No, when we stand before God. You know, the most important question he's going to ask us, did you raise saints? You know, he's not going to ask you, did your son get into Harvard? Did he did he play this travel sports mm -hmm. team? No, that's going to be the question. And we will be accountable for our children. If they go to hell, we're likely going to go to hell. You know, if we didn't do the best that we did. And I but at the same time, you know, that's when we need to call upon the saints. And, you know, I may have mentioned in the last show, but someone came up to Maximilian Colby's mom and they asked her, what did you do You know, to raise a saint? And she said, I begged the mother of God to supply for my inadequacies. And so mm. she relied on Our Lady, you know, and that's why Maximilian Colby, he has this devotion to Our Lady. It's it's from his parents. You know, they, his father would go on Marian processions. It was, it was a, I think it was 11-day Marian procession in the summertime to Our Lady of Chestahova. So this is what parents, you know, the, the, that's why I say the parents of the saints are they are the hidden heroes. They are the examples for their children. And, and as parents in these times, you know, if we want our children to be saints, you know, we we can't just tell them what to do. We have to lead, lead by prayer, by confession, by penance. And so that's the hope that we see in these times, these messages of Our Lady. It's like, you know, we have to be the generals of our home, the fathers do, and, and the wives, you know, they got to fight alongside with us. My yeah. uh, The reason I'm a priest is because my mom got up at 6 a.m. while we were still sleeping and dad had the house and went to mass every single day of her life. And she prayed and prayed obviously for all of her children, but her and her mother actually prayed for my, uh, my vocation to the priesthood. And they didn't tell me that till I was ordained a deacon. So, but mm -hmm. I did watch her every single day. Um, uh, make me, you know, when, when, it, when the modernists started taking over and people started going to mass less, my mom was the only one left, uh, Father Schuster had that mass, and he wouldn't cancel it. He had it for my mom. She was the only one going to the mass, and uh, so they called it. My mom's name was June, so they called it the June Mass. But uh, but he loved that she was doing that, and he was going to do that for her. But so um, you know that's something that parents need to do too, right? Be rooted strongly in the sacraments. Be rooted strongly in the Eucharist. Be rooted strongly in Our Lady. And she every morning mass, she had the rosary wrapped around those hands, and she was praying it. Uh, before uh, mass started. So anyway. Uh, I, I would say this too, and Patrick, I want your thought on this. For parents out there who might be hearing this, and this might be the first time that it's kind of waking up in some of them, you know, that, that metanoia moment, that I haven't been that kind of parent. I haven't taken those steps. My kids are maybe older. They're further down the line. Um, some have left the faith. Some are very lukewarm in the faith and what have you. I, I just want to encourage you not to be discouraged if you're a parent out there. Now, this book, we're going to have a link in the description below. Um, I put the picture up several times here, and here it is again for people. I want people to know, even get this book. This is a great, a great place to start. Turn to Our Lady of Sorrows. She has a great ability to help reveal to each of us personally where our flaws and weaknesses are so we can become better. And in the case of being a parent trying to raise your kids... And for us who are grandparents now to be good examples and good inspirations to our grandchildren. But but this part, Patrick, I'd like your comment on about encouraging parents not to beat themselves up if they have not been the type of parent they could be. But because we're talking about confession, let's get things turned around and get on board with being that type of parent and start making those incremental changes to, to and, and the better steps we can take so that we can be an inspiration and an influence on our children. Can you comment on that? I'd like to say that, you know, the story of, we all know it was St. Monica, but just off, I mean, there's things that she could have done better, right? Her husband was a pagan. I mean, maybe she should have married a Catholic guy, right? <laughs> but that wasn't in the cards. She didn't do, she wasn't called in that moment, but she offered her sufferings, whatever she had and kept praying, you know, it was 19 years for Augustine. And so whatever time we have left, you know, that there's redemptive suffering in that and just offering all of our sufferings for our children's conversion. And it doesn't end in this life. You know, there's a story of, you know, blessed Bartolo Longo and who became a, a satanic priest. You know, if, if you can imagine the worst thing possible, probably for a Catholic parent, like your, your child becomes a satanic priest. And that happened. 
But after the father, his father died, he appeared to his son, you know, to Blessed Bartolo and said, return to God, return to God. So your mission doesn't end on earth, right? I mean, in heaven, I mean, you're going to be praying for your child's conversion. So have, you know, take comfort in that. And so those are uh, just a few stories that I think that can give parents hope that, you know, that we're, and, and whatever moment we have, like we can always, you know, we can always pray, pray for our children and and, and God can use that. Here I am yeah. thinking about my mom again when you said that because uh, five years into my priesthood, 1993, my mom passed away. Um, and I was extremely close to my mother. Uh, we were best friends. And uh, we loved each other dearly. And you know what? I'm even in a stronger relationship now uh, since her passing. So I just encourage you, uh, everyone to keep that relationship alive. Uh, they're praying for us. I know she prays. Uh, constantly for me. I know she's uh, near to Our Lady, near to Our Lord, and we'll be together again one day. But um, the, you're right, Patrick. The relationship doesn't die in death. Uh, it remains strong if 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 you if you want to keep that relationship alive. So I encourage everybody yeah. to do that. So anyway, I, can I, I, yeah, go real ahead. quick, Father. I just want to say this too to everybody out there. If you're if you're wondering as a parent where to start, start with the rosary. Right. Start with confession. For personal, you know, we've got to clean up ourselves and and start with that rosary. Um, Sister Lucia made it clear there's nothing that cannot be obtained through the prayer of the rosary. Of course, if it's God's will, but God does want all of us close to Him. So pray for your children, pray for your grandchildren, pray for your spouse, pray for yourself. You know, let's be praying that rosary like we mean it. I mean, I've always said, and I'll say one more quick time here: when I die, if God allows my children and grandchildren to come and view my body. You know, normal Catholic funeral, the hand, the rosary is wrapped around the hands as it's laid over the chest. I never wanted my kids to walk up and see me lying there and say, what's that? We yeah. don't know why that rosary is on dad's hands. That was not what he did. I want them to walk up and see the rosary and say, that was an extension of my father. That yeah. was part of his life. I've prayed on enough rosaries personally many times and a couple of them are your combat rosaries father so that when i die all of my children can have a personal rosary that dad prayed on regularly i wanted to do this and they all know this and so i just encourage parents out there if you want to pass on a legacy to your kids look your finances and putting them through college and sports and all that okay it might have a place to a degree but all that's passing anyway but the faith and teach them how to pray the rosary, how to have a devotion to Mary. Teach them what adoration, not what it is, what it looks like by them seeing us go right. and taking them. These are things we can do to pass on a real legacy. Patrick, you, would you agree with that or, or any comments on that? I do. You know, close to Father is the birthplace of Blessed Solanus Casey, right along the banks of the Mississippi River. And I, I got to go and found his property there where he was born. It's obviously the, the log cabin's gone, but there was, I think, 16 children in his household. And he called his mm. home a house of prayer. And every night they had scheduled time. So, you know, six o'clock or whatever, they would come in and all the children and they would rotate praying a decade of the rosary. And I, I just think that that's, that's where Solanus, you know, that faith it that he received that enabled him to become a saint it was at home, you know, praying the rosary. So I definitely think that that devotion, the two pillars, as you know, Don Bosco saw in those vision, mm -hmm. the Eucharist and our and the rosary, those are the two pillars to raise saints. Nice. That's nice. a great way for us to end. So let's ask God, uh, please, um, let's let's see that great awakening. Let's see that revival in the land. I keep calling it a supernatural revival, mm -hmm. a belief in the supernatural power of God a reliance on it, and a running toward it in our lives. So let's uh, ask God to pour out his Holy Spirit, especially as we're heading now uh, toward uh, the the Feast of Pentecost. Forty days from uh, the eclipse is uh, the Vigil of Pentecost. So let's ask God to pour out the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Patrick. Patrick. Oh, thank Thanks you. for coming on again, brother. Oh, I appreciate it. I bless you both. Thanks so much.